morning uh, when it's not miserable hot. I was in Georgia this week. Um, it is miserable hot there. Think of our colleagues down there with no air conditioning because for some reason some of them still don't have it. We're not sure about that. Um, are there any announcements this morning that we need to share with the congregation? Okay then. Um, please rise as you are able as we begin worship. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Our opening hymn is number 487.
be seated.
There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in all. But each of us was given grace according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, it is said, when he ascended on high, he made captivity itself a captive. He gave gifts to his people. When it says he ascended, what does it mean? But, he had, but that he had also descended into the lower parts of the earth. He who descended is the same one who ascended far above all the heavens, so that he might fill all things. The gifts he gave were that some would be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers, to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ, until all of us come to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, to maturity, to the measure of the full stature of Christ. We must no longer be children tossed to and fro and blown about by every wind of doctrine, by people's trickery, by their craftiness, in deceitful scheming. But speaking the truth in love, we must grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined in and together by every ligament with which it is equipped, as each part is working properly, promotes the body's growth in building itself up in love. This is the word of the Lord. So 
So if it's round and a hole in it, you'll leave. Maybe. Okay, cool. So, how do you know you can eat it? You know it's food. It's purple. Well, I guess there are purple foods. Some foods can be different colors. There's green stuff. Sometimes you eat green stuff. <coughs> Unless it's mold. <laughs> yeah, you'll get old enough soon that you'll just tear that part off. <laughs> That's not mold, thank you. That's good. So, if you just saw these kind of laying at the house, you'd know it's okay to eat them. I mean, say, not that you can still ask permission. Okay. What? Can they test it to see if it's still good? Yeah. Smell test usually works. Taste test, and then you find it's mold. <laughs> but, you see, the reason we can eat stuff like this, and I, and I laugh because my children had, this was called sermon snack when my kids were little, and it only came out just now during the service. That sounded like a good idea until we needed to break them of that at a certain age, and that was really a parenting fail. Um, so you know you can eat this because we've seen it before, right? What happens with food that you're seeing for the first time?
They said, what is it? How many times have you looked at a plate and wondered that? Since Christmas, most of your food. Now your mama goes back. Um, so, but they they said, "What is it?" And Moses said, "It's it's it's food from God." And they trusted him because they knew Moses loved them, and God loved them, and so they were going to try something new. And so sometimes we get things that are new, and we don't really know what to do with them. But they are food to help us grow. Oh, the fruit loops? No, no, no. You should stick with these without the marshmallows. Ugh. So, when God gives us things, sometimes it's things like this, and sometimes it's things we don't quite understand. And it's hard to be thankful, and it's hard to trust. But that's what we have to do. Will you pray with me? Dear God, thank you for your love. Thank you for giving me the things I need. Amen. Thank you.
Just the night before, they had received a gift from God in a form they knew. So they probably quite literally jumped on it. But the morning nourishment, what is it? They don't know what to do. So why does Jesus say he is one nourishing food from God but not the other? If you've ever wondered what random thoughts go through my head in preparing for a sermon, that is quite literally the kind of stuff I think about. 2,000 years later, could you imagine if we were sitting here singing, I am the quail of life? It just sounds wrong. And then think about the communion prep. The altar guild roasting meat every day. Though red wine is the proper pairing for quail. But I have to think God sends two nourishing foods to people crying out in frustration. So why does Jesus identify with one more than the other? I mean, does that make the quail a less special gift? Well, no, it is a gift from God. It is no less special. But why be the bread of life? What makes Jesus the bread of heaven and not the quail of earth? You see, when the birds descend upon the camp, the people know what they are and what to do with them. They have received a gift from God that is of this world as they know and comprehend it. When the quail appear, they know roughly how many birds it takes to feed their family. And these probably weren't sickly quail either. These are quail from God. They're going to be nice, plump, little hearty things. There was plenty of food to prepare in a way they knew and understood it. But the bread of heaven that they get in the morning, it isn't of this world. And it isn't anything they have ever seen or used to preparing. The bread was like flakes on the ground. I mean, if you grow up like me and I think of the ground covered, there's pans of biscuits everywhere. That is not what they find. They don't even find loaves of bread as they understand bread. Instead, they find these fine little flakes that are so light they glisten and shimmer in the grass. The question starts to become, okay, how much of that is it going to take to feed my family? me. So when they ask, what is it? It probably also had a little bit of, and what do I do with it? In the context. Now I can look back and see that God had provided for the people then with things of this world and things of heaven in the two meals. And God continues today to provide us with quail and man. We each receive gifts from God and, and, and I believe most of us know what to do with the quail gifts that show up in our lives. And I'm reasonably certain most of us are equally as clueless with what to do with the manna that appears in our lives. God sends us quail in the form of shelter, caring people, food we know how to prepare, things we understand and know what to do with are gifts from God, just like quail. And interestingly, those gifts from God, to go off slightly academic, basically form the basis of Maslow's hierarchy of needs to feel secure. Food and shelter and a community. And that's what God is providing in the quail. 
we encounter the gifts of God that are of this world, and, and we tend to embrace them and readily and easily accept them because they make us secure. But that's also what makes Jesus the man, the bread of heaven. Because, honestly, when I truly encounter Christ, I still don't know what to do with him. Kind of like the Israelites with the man. Encountering Jesus in our world is encountering a true, unqualified love. And we as sinful humans just don't do that naturally. Encountering Jesus' passionate grace is unlike any grace I know, as it is far more patient than any human being is capable of. I am always reminded and take great hope in the story of the rich man who asked Jesus, how do I get into heaven? And Jesus says, sell everything you have and give it to the man can't do it. And he walks away. And in one of the great moments of the gospel, it says that Jesus looked at him and loved him. That is an understanding and a grace that can only come from heaven. Because I'm reasonably sure most folks on earth would have a similar reaction to the rich man not the reaction Jesus has. Because if I told someone and they walked right away and said, yeah, no, I can't do that, not really sure looked at them and loved them is going to be what they wrote about me. That kind of love and grace can only come from God. My humanity is not capable of that kind of love. Because love from God is not transactional. Love, a transactional love, wants something in exchange. God's love expects nothing in return and keeps on giving. Grace that appears to me in the storms of life, though I've ignored Christ in my day-to-day -day activities, yet when I call out in desperation, is immediately there. That is manna from heaven. The manna was there each morning, the quail each evening. Gifts of this world and gifts not of this world. Something the people understood and something they had to wrestle to comprehend. Once the people saw how filling the manna was, they understood its power. They understood that something small and light could fill their lives and satisfy their hunger. Just as we can see that a small amount of Christ's forgiveness and love fills massive holes in the lives of us and those around us. There was so much manna. There was so much bread in the gospel. And there is so much Jesus today. And there's plenty for everyone. God did not say, here's enough and don't let those people have it. Did not say, don't give those folks over their bread. They aren't like us. They're lazy and need to go find their own. There was plenty for everyone, regardless of who you were, who you liked, who you got along with, who you were related to, how you were dressed, pick anything. There was plenty, and then there was some left over. And that, my friends, is the grace of God. God said take only what you need because there was enough for everyone and there would be more tomorrow. The bread of life never runs out. 
It's there to nourish you and me each and every day. And if you need a little more one day, it doesn't mean there's less for me on that day. God provides, and that is far more giving and selfless than most of us can comprehend. Even the most Lutheran among us, the most stalwart Christian martyr on a pedestal by the community of a church, will get greedy when it comes to forgiveness, even though we know God has enough for all of us. Every one of us will start thinking that that person over there doesn't deserve a human helping of God's hospitality because I want it. I mean, we treat earthly gifts that way. We hoard our stuff. And honestly, every one of us has at some point tried to treat the divine gifts of God's forgiveness that way. We want to determine who gets what and if you get some, that means there's less for me. Well, that's wrong because that's earthly thinking, not divine thinking. If you think about it, that's the complete opposite of the words we say in the Last Supper. Because the words, I, my, and mine, never appear in the prayer. Only our and us. Because there is enough quail. And there is enough manna then and now. We just have to trust that it will be there. Jesus is the bread of life because Jesus is not of this world. Not in body, not in spirit, and not in attitude. But neither are we. Because we too are children of God fed with the bread of heaven, washed with the living water. In route to our promised land, if we will only stop complaining and start trusting. We follow a God in heaven who created a world that we corrupted, so why can't we trust there'll be enough of the things on earth and heaven for everyone God created? Even if we don't like to admit those people are children of God too. I mean, some days we can. Some days we find it easy to have faith and know that there's plenty. But some days I just can't. And that too is what makes Jesus the bread of heaven. Because he's there every morning. Whether I like it or not, whether I'm looking for it or not, whether I'm expecting it or not. Providing love and forgiveness and mercy in quantities none of us can begin to imagine or even try. Take and eat the gifts of this world and the gifts of heaven. Share them freely because God promises that when we do, there will be enough to fill us all. And it is so hard to believe and it is so true. And when we have those times that we just can't follow through with that belief, with grace, Jesus looks at us and loves us. Amen. Our hymn of the day is number 460. Rise your age.
Father, your Holy Spirit sustains us, and your Son Jesus feeds and strengthens us. We pray for your church and all of creation. Bless our leaders, Elizabeth Eaton, John Monkholz, our Bishop-elect, Lee Miller II, our pastor, Susan Poyotek, our missionary, Karen Anderson, and our leader in worship today, David Grindle. Give them wisdom and strength to lead and set examples for us to follow in our daily lives. Hear us, O oh God. You command the winds and the waves. Support firefighters in our western states, battling huge fires. Protect and comfort those who live in the path of these fires. Dear God, so many in our country and around the world are enduring tremendous heat waves and droughts. Cost the leaders worldwide to put into place and enforce crucial new policies, reforesting our lands, replenishing our waterways, and halting pollution of our land, seas, and air. Be with the peoples around the world who have no access to the COVID-19 vaccines and be with those who have hesitated to receive the vaccine. Give them opportunity and willingness to get these life-saving injections. May this be so. Hear us, O oh God. Amen. Draw near to those who cry out for help. Hear the cries of those people who are hungry. Help us to share our bounty with those who are near to us, yet hungry. Lead us to comfort those who are in despair. Accompany people who are in prison. Give us kindness in our hearts for people who don't have enough food, opportunities, housing, and respect. Help us to imagine what it would be like to be walking in their shoes. Give us grace to truly help. Hear us, O oh God. Holy God, bring your healing touch upon those who are ill in any way, especially Dick Granville, John Haynes, Richard Schneider, Bishop Ambrose Moyo, Sally Gould, Victoria King, Dave Lovett, Marcia Dibbins, Donna Bell, Bob McNamara, Gary, Sammy, Jody, Debbie, Lori and Fred Wilsey, Mark Meyer, Hazel Carrick, Chase Salmons, Matthew Wise, Ted Kyder, Alex Gates, Ray, Al Hogan, Nikki Jensen, Tracy O'Connor, and Jenny Granville. You may name anyone who needs God's healing touch. Hear us, O oh God. Receive all who come seeking a sign of grace. Make this congregation a place of hospitality for those accustomed to rejection, to those who have felt excluded here and elsewhere. Prepare us to welcome them in the name of Christ. Hear us, O oh God. You provide food that endures for an eternal life. Sustain us each day with the bread of life until we are gathered with all the saints and feast together at your heavenly banquet. Hear us, O oh God. We lift these and all our prayers to you, O oh God, trusting in the promise of your saving love through Jesus Christ our Lord. Nourish us anew in your 
your tender care and empower us in faithful service to tend to others with this same love. Through Jesus Christ, our saving grace. Amen. Amen. Take a moment.
closing hymn is number 655. 